and thank you for taking the time to join us today. We are delighted to have so many members of both Houses of Parliament with us on Zoom and so many UK Cypriots following this meeting online and via community radio. Traditionally, this meeting jointly organised by the All-Party Parliamentary Group for Cyprus and the National Federation of Cypriots takes place in Parliament. However, as with most things over the last few months, circumstances have forced us online. Having said that, I'm delighted that the Foreign Minister of the Republic of Cyprus, Mr. Nigos Christodoulidis, is able to join us from Nicosia, having just returned from the EU Foreign Affairs Council in Brussels. Later this year marks the 60th anniversary of the establishment of the Republic of Cyprus and 60 years of diplomatic relations with the United Kingdom. This landmark presents an opportunity to reflect and celebrate the achievements and progress made by the state and the people of Cyprus since 1960. Sadly, for 46 of those years, 37% of the territory of the Republic of Cyprus has been under military occupation by Turkey following its illegal invasion on July the 20th, 1974. Not content with just the territory of the Republic of Cyprus, Turkey is now laying claims to areas of the exclusive economic zone and continental shelf of the Republic of Cyprus and undertaking illegal drilling activities. We are grateful to the UK government, as well as the Labour Party, Liberal Democrats and SNP for their clear condemnation of Turkey's illegal actions in Cypriot waters. Sadly, Turkey's illegal occupation means that the Republic of Cyprus has only been free and united for less than a quarter of its entire existence. However, we remain steadfast in our belief that a reunited Cyprus, where all Cypriots could peacefully live and prosper together, is both attainable and viable. It would also further elevate the country as an international and regional hub. What we want is fair, simple and rooted in international law, a free united Cyprus through a solution that is based on the relevant UN Security Council resolutions and high level agreements. However, despite the ongoing occupation, the Republic of Cyprus has defied the odds and shines as a democratic, modern and stable nation that has grown into an active member of the European Union and the Commonwealth in an otherwise troubled part of the world. Through a period of regional instability and unrest, Cyprus has remained a beacon of hope, stability and prosperity in the Eastern Mediterranean and wider region. Today, Cyprus is home to around 60,000 UK nationals. The UK is home to a diaspora of 300,000 UK Cypriots, and there is an abundance of trade between the two countries. So as the UK takes its first steps in a world where it is not a member of the European Union, it can safely look towards the Republic of Cyprus as a reliable and predictable partner. This partnership is steeped in history and in deep person-to-person -person relationships. And in closing, I'd like to pay tribute to all the presidents of the Republic of Cyprus for their immense contribution to Cyprus's growing national story. I'd also like to thank the countless British parliamentarians, including all of you joining us tonight, who have opposed the ongoing occupation stood beside the Republic of Cyprus throughout its first 60 years of existence. Thank you for your time and for joining us this evening. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce our next speaker, um, His Excellency the Foreign Minister of the Republic of Cyprus, Mr. Nigos Christodoulidis. Thank you, Chris. Uh, good evening to all. Thank you very much for the, for the virtual presence and uh, for your interest in, in Cyprus. Uh, Sir Roger Gale, honorable members of the parliament, the, the all party parliamentary group on, on Cyprus is playing a, a very important role in promoting the Cyprus UK relations, as well as in bringing to the forefront the vital issues for, for Cyprus. We are grateful for the, for the group's contribution all, all those years. I'm also uh, particularly pleased that the, the Minister of Europe and the Americans, uh, Wendy, is uh, with us this uh, this evening. I wish to to express, of course, my appreciation to the organizers of, of this meeting, to Chris. Um, in the middle of, of a pandemic, we are witnessing important changes and shifts, and I believe this event provides a, a very timely opportunity to exchange views on a array of of issues, focusing in particular, especially from my side, on on our foreign policy, Cyprus foreign policy 60 years after the independence, the complex, very important relationship between Cyprus and the UK, especially the post-Brexit era, in which the UK will remain an important partner, both for, both for Cyprus, but also for the European Union. 
developments in the in the Eastern Mediterranean, we are, as Chris uh, very correctly mentioned, Turkey's aggressive policy in Cyprus exclusive economic zone and beyond is undermining stability and security. And finally, I'll refer to where we are with regards to the Cyprus problem and how we envision the, the way forward. Let me begin by presenting very briefly an overview of Cypriot foreign policy 60 years following uh, independence. Uh, Cyprus foreign policy has been undoubtedly and understandably, I would say, dominated by the fact that uh, we are a small country with a national problem of the magnitude of the, of the Cyprus problem with 37% of uh, Cyprus territory occupied and with a physical presence of approximately 40,000 Turkish occupied uh, troops. Certainly, so long as the situation on the ground continues to be one of the illegal occupation, the solution of the, of the Cyprus problem remains the number one priority of the, of the Cyprus government at the heart of its, uh, of its foreign policy. With this as uh, given, uh, we made a conscious decision over the past few years to also embark on a different strategy, uh, to go beyond a monothematic, I would say, foreign policy, projecting into a diverse polythematic uh, one, one, utilizing Cyprus' uh, unique characteristics, amplifying our strategic role and promoting a vision for our region that resonates well beyond <clears throat> sorry, the boundaries of the Eastern Mediterranean. The rationale is that the, the benefits accrued will also have a beneficial effect in our efforts to reun reunify the country and its people, because as I told you, this is our number one priority. Um, the multifaceted foreign policy I referred to is anchored on three main pillars. The first pillar is the the enhancement and the expansion of our relations with all countries in our immediate region, the Middle East and the Gulf. At the heart of this uh, first pillar is the unique uh, geographical position of, of Cyprus, building on the traditionally excellent relations with our neighbors. We have worked uh, methodically in deepening our ties and building cooperation that brings tangible results that are beneficial not only for the countries involved, but also for, for the region. For example, a recent example, there has been enormous, I would say, solidarity extended during the pandemic in this network of close partnership in a, in a very tangible manner. Beyond the, the bilateral uh, value of this effort, our actions are also underpinned by a long-term vision for, uh, for our region. We believe this vision of uh, building bridges through synergies and cooperation is relevant not only for the region and its countries, but also for Europe and beyond. We believe our vision for the Eastern Mediterranean is relevant because the region is, uh, is relevant. Together with, uh, with Greece and others in the, in the neighborhood, such as Israel, Egypt, Jordan, Palestine, Lebanon, UAE, uh, Cyprus has worked to establish trilateral cooperation mechanisms, which uh, were in fact triggered by the energy developments uh, in, in our region, with the realization that these developments have the potential of also reshaping the political map of the region. And I believe we are seeing this, uh, this um, unraveling. This innovative cooperation forum um, reflect our strategy to create synergies and forge closer cooperation with moderate countries of, of, of the region in a broad range of, of areas, from political and economic cooperation uh, to security, cultural innovation, education, and central. Um, the central pillars of the trilateral cooperation is that they are not directed against any third country. We didn't decide to come together because we don't like one of our neighbors. On the contrary, they are an instrument for promoting cooperation in the region. Uh, they evolve in areas where there is a cooperative advantage, and they have been broadened to bringing in additional partners in specific fields. For example, we have had the United States, France, 
the European Union. Even with the UK, we had some, some discussions uh, to participate uh, in some of the trilaterals for specific areas where there is, uh, there is an interest. For example, energy with the European uh, Union, security uh, with the French, terrorism with the, with the United States. Um, our second foreign policy pillar uh, is the more active involvement of Cyprus within the European Union beyond issues that directly touch upon the Cyprus problem or Turkey, which as you understand for a long time following our accession in the European Union in 2004 was the case. We have a <coughs> to build our voice in Brussels on an array of, of issues where Cyprus has a strong added value. For example, Cyprus has a deep understanding of the way countries in the region operate, how to get messages across effectively. Uh, from their mm -hmm. side, countries in the region often react to what they see as a lack of understanding by Brussels of the complexities of the region and the dynamics within uh, their countries. So Cyprus is seen as a credible, trustworthy, reliable, I'll say, channel of communication between the European Union and countries in the neighborhood. And this is being increasingly uh, recognized both from the countries of the, of the region, but also from the, from the European Union. <clears throat> we believe that in the post-Brexit uh, uh, era, Cyprus, uh, a country that has traditionally closed, I'll say unique ties to the UK, also has an important role to play in ensuring a strong partnership between the United Kingdom and the European Union. We have consistently made the case during the negotiation between uh, Brussels and London that the UK must remain a key partner to the European Union post-Brexit. Now coming to the third pillar of our foreign policy, uh, this relates to the strengthening of relations with the five permanent members of the United Nations Security Council as well as with some other key partners in the international arena, like uh, in Japan and, and India. We are working on building our relationships with the, with the five permanent members of the Security Council beyond the remit of the discussions of the Cyprus problem at the Security Council. That was the case in the past. Uh, creating an evolving and continuously advancing strategic cooperation in all fields. Uh, I'll give you an example for, for with the United States relations uh, uh, at the bilateral, but also at regional level have grown at a remarkable, I'll say, pace over the past few years in areas such as security, energy, but we are always working on a positive agenda. We are not working together against a third country, always on a positive agenda. Turning now on, um, on our bilateral relations, Cyprus UK uh, relations, as you know, uh, long standing uh, relations are entering mm -hmm. a new phase in this post Brexit uh, era. As I have mentioned, I see a lot of potential for closer, expanding cooperation in a wide range of, uh, of, uh, of issues. There are a lot of examples that uh, indicate that when uh, Cyprus and the United Kingdom work together, in an open, always frank uh, manner, there is a mutually beneficial outcome. The, the most recent example, and I would like to mention this, we, we discussed it also with Wendy and also the, the, the foreign secretary, is of course the signing of the agreement on the non-military development of the bases in Cyprus, uh, an agreement reached after 60 years of, of discussion. It was the decisiveness of the two governments that uh, resulted in the agreement. It was certainly a time-consuming, uh, uh, difficult process through constructive cooperation between uh, the Republic of Cyprus and the UK government who overcame obstacles through mutually beneficial uh, solutions. What drove both sides was the enormous positive uh, impact, economic and not only, for the people living in, in these areas, the fact that this is the biggest actually change on the use of land and development of the various zones within the bases since the establishment of the Republic of Cyprus in 1960 should not, uh, should not evade us. 
The implementation of the agreement will pave the way for significant prospects for economic development and activity for the people living there and for the economy in general, particularly now having in mind that in the post-COVID era, uh, we have a lot of economic challenges to, uh, to face. Um, the fact that this agreement was achieved and signed is also indicative of the excellent level, level in the relations between the Republic of Cyprus and the UK. Our countries uh, share long established deep-rooted ties, both at the state level, but also as Chris mentioned, uh, at the level of our people. Uh, in, in recent years, these ties have been uh, further enhanced and expanded with close and effective cooperation in a wide range of, of fields at bilateral, European, and international level. And of course, we also cooperate uh, in the Commonwealth. You are well aware, Crystal mentioned the, the number of the importance of the, of the human links uh, that play in the constant development of, uh, of our bilateral relations. Now coming to the, to the Eastern Mediterranean, the developments in the Eastern Mediterranean and, uh, and Turkey's role as a, as a spoiler pursuing a neo-Ottoman neo neo vision in the region, I would say. This is an issue that uh, we expect from the UK government to, to convey firm and clear message, uh, messages both in its uh, public statement, but also in its contact uh, with the I understand that uh, Foreign Minister Chabuzoglu was in London two days ago. He had a meeting with Foreign Secretary uh, Rapp. Unfortunately, in, in times of an unprecedented crisis due to the COVID-19 pandemic, which has gripped the whole of, of humanity, Turkey is escalating its uh, provocative actions Ankara, Ankara is carrying a systematic, I'll say, multifaceted strategy to implement um, its hegemonic revisionist uh, vision for the region in a clear violation of uh, international uh, law and to the detriment of the sovereign and national interests, not only of Cyprus, but many countries in, uh, in the region. Rather than being daunted by the effects of the pandemic, uh, the Turkish leadership um, seems to be utilizing the international community disruption caused by the pandemic in order to intensify it and further promote uh, its, uh, its plan. In, uh, in Cyprus, right now, Turkey started a new illegal uh, drilling operation within our maritime zone. That is the, the sixth, sixth drilling in a row in less than, uh, than a year. Just to give you uh, an indication, uh, this the drilling is taking place within exploration block six of Cyprus exclusive economic zone. It's just 51 nautical miles off the southwestern shores of Cyprus, and it's 154 triple the distance from the from the shores of, of Turkey. Block six, um, which was duly licensed by Cyprus to the Italian company ENI and the French company Total, falls within our exclusive economic zone, continental shelf, already delimited between uh, Cyprus and, uh, and Italy. As you understand, Turkey's action is a further severe uh, escalation of its policy uh, of violations of the sovereign rights of, of Cyprus. And of course, this, uh, this activity is coupled with heavy militarization of the seas, around the island by the Turkish Navy, putting the security and the stability at, uh, at the reach. It is important uh, also to, to remember that Turkey's uh, provocations do not take place in a vacuum. They form part of its uh, overall uh, revisionist policy, exemplified uh, by its expansionist actions, either in Syria, its interventions in Libya, uh, North Iraq, illegal actions in Greece. In Greece, uh, we have been witnessing, especially um, uh, the last period, almost daily, a systematic violation of its airspace and the instrumentalization, actually effective we weaponization of migratory flows to, to Europe. And of course, Turkey is also threatening um, with announced drillings of the cost of, of Greece. Um, 
the international community, uh, we believe it's about time to respond in a coherent, fair manner to Mr. Erdogan's increasingly authoritarian, erratic behavior, implementing this uh, neo-Ottoman policy in the region is also a form of distraction, I would say, from the internal situation in Turkey. We have seen this in his unacceptable, most recent action, uh, you are well aware, with regard to, to Hagia Sophia. Uh, at the European level, uh, the, the Union has responded by putting in place last summer a regime of restrictive measures against Turkey. During the foreign affairs meeting yesterday, it was agreed that uh, this will be further enhanced on the basis of the proposals already submitted by, by us, while additional sectoral measures will be explored by the High Representative, Mr. Borrell, and be presented uh, on the can at the Council, given also Turkey's escalating behavior against, uh, against uh, Greece. We also look, as I told you, to the UK to stand up uh, for international legality, and in doing so, sending a, a clear message to Turkey is, is, is very important. It is also important to convey these uh, concerted messages to, to Turkey, because in the, the current very difficult situation, I would say poisonous climate of provocation and aggression, it cannot be expected that uh, result-oriented negotiations for the Cyprus problem can resume. No one can negotiate under such a uh, uh, duress. We remain strongly committed to the efforts uh, to reunify Cyprus and its uh, people, and we are ready to resume negotiations from where they halted by Turkey's uh, demands at Grand Montana. For us, there is no alternative uh, and the status quo cannot be the solution of the Cyprus problem. The status quo cannot be the future of, of, of Cyprus. Uh, following the meeting of President Astasiadis and Mr. Kinky with uh, Secretary UN Secretary General Guterres in November 2019 in Berlin, the approach uh, was to resume the negotiation process from the point uh, negotiations ended in Grand Montana immediately after the election process in the occupied areas. Regrettably, due to the pandemic, this was, wasn't possible, and the election process uh, will take place uh, in October. In the meantime, um, we ask Turkey to show concretely its own commitment, ceasing all illegal activities in Cyprus, exclusive economic zone, so as to pave the way for many meaningful negotiations for a viable, lasting, comprehensive settlement of bi-zonal, bi-communal federation, always in line with the UN Security Council resolution, and of course, international and EU law. A solution that creates conditions for peace, stability, and prosperity, not only for the country, not only for Cyprus, but also uh, for the region. Uh, dear friends, um, the Cyprus problem is not a bi-communal problem, it's a problem of innovation and occupation. Turkey's uh, erratic behavior in the region is constant interference, even more even uh, more recently, I would say, on the issue of the reopening of the crossing points uh, following temporary closure due to the, the pandemic, clearly demonstrate who bears the responsibility for the for the current unacceptable situation in, in Cyprus. We hope and we work for this direction that the upcoming United Nations Security Council uh, resolution on the renewal of uh, the mandate of the United Nations Force in Cyprus, UNFISIP, will send a strong message on the importance of creating the necessary conditions for the resumption of the negotiations for a comprehensive settlement of by zonal by communal federation. The UK's role is of utmost importance I have to say we are working closely with the UK government and discussed this issue with Dominique Rapp last week. Um, and we're working towards the, the same direction. And we are looking forward to, to your support to put an end to the division of, of Cyprus. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chris. Menacing all of these, thank you very much for that. Um, next up, I'd like to ask, um, 
Minister Wendy Morton, Minister for um, the European Neighbourhood in the Americas, to kind of offer her remarks as well. Um, thank you. Thank you so much, Christos. And uh, I think we should also thank you for making this um, annual meeting happen this evening, in spite of the, uh, the current COVID um, circumstances that we, that we find our, ourselves in. And, and I'm really pleased to be able to join you all, all this evening. Um, but let me start by just reflecting on the, on the last few months. Um, you know, we've, we've seen COVID-19 and the lockdown have such a huge impact on each and every, every one of us. And, and sadly, far too many have lost loved ones to, to the virus. And, and I know the Cypriot community here in the UK has also been impacted too. So, so my, my, my heartfelt sympathies go out to those who have been have been um, impacted and, and affected. Um, but and it, especially the, the friends and, and, and the families of, of those we've lost. But on a positive note, the pandemic has shown how strong our relationship really is. Um, the Foreign Secretary and I have spoken to, to Nikos um, a number of times during the pandemic. Um, since March, Britain and Cyprus have worked closely together to help Cypriots in the UK and Brits in Cyprus to return home. Many friends and many families have been reunited, reminding us once again of the close links between our two countries. And so in spite of the pandemic, our relationship has grown in recent months. Um, we now have the arrangement on non-military development in the sovereign basis. And last month's announcement shows how committed both our countries are to developing those links and to finding new ways to cooperate. But I'll just close really with a, a comment on, on settlement, if I may. And that is that you know, recent, recent developments really underline the importance of a comprehensive, just and lasting settlement of the Cyprus issue. And one that's based on the internationally accepted model of a bizonal, bicommunal federation. We continue to believe that the best long-term way to resolve tensions in the region including on the Turkish exploration of hydrocarbons in the waters around Cyprus, is to achieve a settlement on the Cyprus issue. And we really hope that all parties will redouble their efforts towards a settlement. For my part, I hope that the coming months will see both communities safe, well, and taking concrete steps to realize that goal. And I really hope that our UK Cypriot links, whether they're political or personal, can keep going from strength to strength. And again, Christos, I thank you for inviting me along this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Um, I know your time constraints, so if, if you do need to leave us, thank you very much for taking the time to join us. Um, next up, I, I'd like to ask our kind of chair of the all party group, Sir Roger Gale, um, to say a few words. Sir Roger. Your Excellency, uh, Ministers, ladies, gentlemen, can I first add my thanks to Christos for organizing this annual event? Um, strange circumstances to hold it in, but I'd like to welcome all of those who are joining us via live streaming and all those who are listening on radio. And the curious thing is that in spite of the bizarre circumstances, we may have a larger audience than we would normally have. And so then that's a very good thing. Um, I'd like to add also my condolences to those expressed by Wendy, our minister, uh, to all of our friends, families, who've lost loved ones in the course of the pandemic. It's a terrible experience, uh, every loss. We, we, we listen to statistics, you know, 20,000, 30,000, 40,000. But of course, one, if it's your family, is one too many. And, and we really feel for you. But as, as the minister has said, it has strengthened ties. It's proven that there is a really strong bond that has been established over 60 years since independence between the United Kingdom and the Republic of Cyprus. And we know, we all know from this group, uh, without party politics being involved, of the incredibly strong friendships that we have built up with our colleagues on the island of Cyprus. Um, and in my case, I'm proud to be able to say that I've had a wonderful relationship with a succession of distinguished high commissioners, of which Andreas is uh, the latest and the immensely welcome. And I'm glad that you're with us here tonight, uh, High Commissioner. Um, 
my late friend Robin Corbett, who was the chairman of the All Party Group before I was, used to say, wouldn't it be wonderful if we could say Cyprus without then making the next word a problem? Um, 46 years is far too long. We all know that. I have the privilege of leading the United Kingdom delegation to the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe, where quite rightly, uh, the Ukrainians within the Parliamentary Assembly raised continually the annexation of part of their country, Crimea, by the Russians. And they say this has been going on for you know, half a dozen years. Well, forgive me, there's another country that's been partly occupied for 46 years, and that's the island of Cyprus. And we continually try to raise this issue as well in the Parliamentary Assembly, because it is so important. And I also know that um, in coming weeks, if, as we hope, there will be a plenary session in Strasbourg in October, the uh, issue of Hagia Sophia will be raised, both within the Culture Committee, but also, I trust, within the full plenary circle, because it is quite wrong that this World Heritage should have been appropriated by Turkey and back into a mosque, forgetting, of course, the most beautiful and historic Greek Orthodox cathedral in the world. And we will do whatever we can to work with our Greek and Cypriot friends to try to reverse that decision, although I suspect that's going to be quite difficult. Um, the issue of the oil exploration has been raised. That, so far as your friends in the United Kingdom are concerned, is entirely unacceptable. This is an illegal act taking place in Cypriot waters. It cannot be allowed to continue, and it has been condemned by our government, and it has been condemned by all of those who regard themselves within the United Kingdom Parliament as friends of Cyprus. So there are many who wish to contribute tonight. I mustn't take up more time, but I will end as I always do, and sadly it's been for too long, by saying that we know what we want. We want a united Cyprus, united on fair terms, in which Turkish Cypriots and Greek Cypriots can live in peace and harmony, and we will stand with you and for you for as long as it takes. Thank you. Thank you, Sir Roger, for that um, typically clear and forthright um, intervention. Next up, I'd like to ask Fabian Hamilton, the Shadow Minister for Peace and Disarmament, to say a few words. Thank you very much, uh, Christos. Uh, High Commissioner Andreas uh, Christos, uh, Sir Roger, uh, Foreign Minister, of course, Nikos Christodoulidis, who I count as a good friend, um, Minister Wendy Morton, I know she's had to go, but she is also a good friend. Um, colleagues, friends in the diaspora who are watching, welcome this evening and thank you for allowing me to speak. Wendy mentioned in her speech, and other, as others have, as Roger mentioned, the effect that COVID-19 has had on individuals and families. And I'm sorry to report to you that this morning my own mother-in-law died from complications resulting from covid infection and it's been a real blow to us uh, so I will be leaving fairly shortly to ring my children uh, about and talk about their grandmother. Um, 46 years ago in 1974 studying for A-levels in London, I am that old I'm afraid, um, I had in my class a number of Greek Cypriot uh, citizens who'd come to London to study who became good and dear friends in that one year. And in the summer of 74, most went back to Nicosia and to the villages and towns in Cyprus that they came from. And of course, we know what happened. One of them, whose name was Nick Loizu, was killed directly by a Turkish tank. Now, when you're 19 years old, something like that has a profound effect on you. 
And from that day to this, I've never forgotten that, uh, that Cyprus was invaded by the Turkish army and that people on both sides were killed as a result. And so I've committed myself and I hope our party collectively, we have a strong affinity with Cyprus and the Cypriot diaspora to working with all of you across all parties, as Roger says, for peace and reunification. Now, a solution we believe in the Labour Party must be in line with UN Security Council resolutions, as others have said, as Foreign Minister Nikos has also said. And of course, the high level agreements, the EU acquis, as well as the Guterres framework, all articulated in Kranz Montana that can and will be picked up again, I hope. So we in the Labour Party support the reunification of Cyprus as a bizonal, bicommunal federation that is a normal and viable state. Cyprus is a member of the European Union, which sadly we're no longer, uh, and it is a member of the Commonwealth, which we are very strongly supportive of on all sides of the House of Commons. It does not require, however, outdated guarantees or occupation by foreign troops. And a just solution must also address the crucial issue of property and allow refugees from both communities to reclaim their properties taken from them after the invasion, if they choose to do so. And I think for far too long now, the people of Cyprus have been divided. So we hope that the negotiations are able to recommence as soon as possible from where they left off. And the occupation of part of the island by Turkish troops must end in order to pave the way for reunification. Now, we also believe that we must rapidly address the humanitarian issue of the missing persons and encourage all governments to fully cooperate to bring closure on this terrible issue. My friends, from the outset, the Labour Party has been consistent in its respect for the sovereign rights of the Republic of Cyprus by condemning Turkey's illegal drilling in the exclusive economic zone of the Republic of Cyprus and of course in the continental shelf. And as uh, many speakers have said already, this is now the sixth time that Turkey's attempted to drill in Cypriot waters. And it's wholly unacceptable act of aggression that we simply believe cannot be justified. And it, it just serves to undermine the confidence and prospects for negotiations to resume. But we're not going to lose hope or lose heart. And that's why uh, our new leader, Sakir Starmer, appointed me specifically as shadow foreign minister, not just for peace and disarmament, but to cover Cyprus, an island I know well and have visited on many, many occasions to try and help and see what the British Labour Party in opposition can do uh, to help with the process of reunification. So Christos, thank you. Uh, so Roger, thank you for inviting me this evening uh, to address you and everybody that's watching on the streaming service. I'm sorry I have to leave. You do understand why, but my heart will always be the people of Cyprus, the island of Cyprus, and the great wonderful diaspora we have in the United Kingdom. Thank you all for being here tonight. And thank you, Nikos. Thank you, Nikos Christodoulidis, for joining us. You are a true friend. Fabian, on behalf of all of us, our heartfelt condolences um, on the loss of um, your mother-in-law. And it's incredible that you're here with us tonight, given the circumstances, so thank you. Um, next up, I'd like to ask Alistair Carmichael, the Lib Dem uh, foreign affairs spokesman, uh, to say a few words. Thanks. Uh, Christos, uh, thank you for, for that. Uh, and uh, thank you, Fabian, for being with us. You know, we've spoken about the friendships that there are within this group. So, you know, I'm pretty sure that all your friends here, Fabian, share your, your loss and, and your tremendous commitment to this issue. Uh, I think it's one testimony by the fact that you're here. And it's uh, very much appreciated, I'm sure, by us all. Um, can I thank you, Christos, and, and uh, Minister, and Your Excellency, for, for your engagement uh, with us on this issue. Um, I, I fear that if Eddie was coming looking for political division or controversy, he'd probably come to the wrong place. 
um, because there's not much that I will see that is really in any way different from what you've heard from Fabian or from Wendy, um, because I think uh, the the position of all the parties really is uh, pretty broadly aligned. We all seek to see the return of a bizonal, bicommunal, uh, federal Cyprus. In some ways, I kind of wish that there was perhaps a bit more controversy in this issue, um, because if there were controversy, then there would perhaps be uh, more attention to it, because I think that one of the great tragedies of, of Cyprus, which is a beautiful island with the most phenomenal uh, people uh, living there. My, I, my only, I only know the tourist, but uh, as an islander myself, uh, I, I envy you, uh, your, your, uh, your, your island community, especially your weather, which is a little bit better than the, the islands that I represent. Um, but um, the, the shared aspiration, I, I'm afraid, means that very often it doesn't get the attention that it needs. And I think if we, uh, as a, a group of UK parliamentarians, can do anything to assist you, and we have very strong and during historic ties and responsibilities to you, believe me, then it should be that we uh, aim to get your uh, issues higher up the agenda uh, in the United Nations Security Council and I am it here uh, Sir Roger talking about the work of the Council of Europe and this that is also going to be important. The Council of Europe in particular I think is important because um, it strikes me that uh, the the, the, the community of interest that we all have, the aspirations that we share, the easy part, it is the question of how you achieve these aims that becomes more challenging. Um, and however you achieve it, however you uh, get to that point of, of, of reconciliation and get a solution that is acceptable and workable and based on property right of both Greek Cypriots and Turkish Cypriots, you can only do that by doing as we would seek to do in Crimea, in Israel-Palestine, in Crimea, wherever else you have these disputed territories around the world, uh, by demonstrating uh, and living a respect for human rights and international law. It was the lack of respect for human rights and international law that created this situation in the first place. So any solution must be rooted in international law. And on the subject of international law, let me just say that um, having precipitated the situation 46 years ago, um, the fact that Turkey continues now to exacerbate the situation by their actions in drilling hydrocarbons uh, can only be seen as an unhelpful and backward step. And like others here, it would be a good sign of good faith in terms of any future negotiation if that were to be a, something from which they would take back and uh, to respect the international law, which at the end of the day, given the opportunity, is something that should take every people in every country in the world. So thank you for uh, your invitation, uh, my first opportunity to engage with National Federation and certainly intend that it will not be the last. Um, and uh, God willing, next time, perhaps it will be a virtual occasion, but we will be able to, uh, to, to renew these bonds of, of friendship and solidarity in the flesh. Thank you, Christoph. Thank, thank you, Alistair, um, for those remarks. Um, next up, Chris Stevens uh, from the SNP would like to say a few words. Well, thank you, uh, Chris. It's, uh, it's going to be very difficult to add uh, to our uh, to the distinguished uh, colleagues, but uh, thank you, Chris, for uh, organising this meeting. Uh, Your Excellency, Minister, thank you uh, very much for your uh, 
uh, address to us uh, about the uh, site Cyprus situation. Uh, obviously, firstly, to uh, congratulate Cyprus and uh, note the 60th anniversary of its independence. Uh, and obviously, a message to uh, all the uh, Cyprus people, uh, our uh, solidarity with them. Uh, as Alistair touched on, uh, Cyprus would probably be a bit busier just now with uh, tourists from the United Kingdom, particularly uh, from Scotland, uh, as we like to visit Cyprus and other places to worship that yellow thing in the sky that we don't necessarily see very much of in Scotland. But uh, I think that also to express a solidarity um, with the people of Cyprus who are uh, dealing with the COVID situation, just as we are all are internationally. And I think that I would want to um, uh, express uh, our condolences uh, to Fabian and his family um, for, for the sad loss of Fabian's mother-in-law. Now, I am a, a long-standing critic of Turkish aggression, and usually when I uh, speak on Turkey, and particularly around the Kurdish issue, I usually get a letter, an angry letter from the Turkish embassy, and no doubt, now that they're aware that I'm in this meeting tonight, I'm sure that I'll, I'll have another one that's uh, coming in the post. Um, but I do want to reiterate what others have said in relation to the over a thousand uh, Cypriot people who are currently missing and Turkey really needs to abide by its, uh, its obligations and its agreements on that to ensure that there are and there is a closure uh, on that issue. Um, and it needs to start respecting uh, international law and it needs to get back to uh, what it's agreed in the past and start to honour those agreements because the fact that it has not I, I can only suggest bad faith in their part. One of the issues which uh, I don't think has yet been touched on, as well as a hydrocarbon issue, is also the, um, a, the illegal and uh, unregulated fishing, which seems to be uh, taking place by, uh, uh, on, a, on a separate waters uh, coming from uh, Turkey. That uh, really needs to be addressed. So I agree with the... Uh, everything that's been said, uh, my solidarity to the uh, Cypriot people, and I'm sure um, that many Scots, once this COVID uh, situation is finished, that many Scots are looking forward to taking back and renewing their friendship with the Cypriot people. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Um, next up, I'd like to ask the uh, Vice Chair of the All Party Group, Bambos Charalambas, to say a few words. Uh, thank you, Christo. And uh, as uh, Christine just said, it's always quite hard to follow when uh, everyone's uh, made such a very powerful um, point. Um, the, I will stop by talking about coronavirus, though, because I think one of the things about coronavirus is it doesn't discriminate who it, uh, um, who it plays. And unfortunately, we've uh, seen a, a significant number of uh, members of the Cypriot community who have lost their lives uh, in the UK. Um, so I just want to pay a tribute to the work that uh, the Federation have done in helping uh, students um, who are stranded in the UK um, get through the coronavirus uh, uh, pandemic. Um, and uh, yes, I also want to say thank you to um, all, all the previous speakers who have made such uh, excellent points. Um, it, it's quite sad we find ourselves here again, um, four to six years after Cyprus was divided. Um, the issues to be the same. Unfortunately, th this year has been a year, of, or the last 12 months, been a year of interruptions. Um, so we've had elections, we've had uh, issues still with coronavirus. Um, but um, as Chris Stevens said earlier, we still need to make sure that the focus is sharp and that we do make sure that Turkey does respect international law and human rights. Um, and we need to judge them by their actions. Everybody wants to make sure that there is a result in the negotiations from where we left off with Krantatana. Um, but we can only do so if there is good faith and some of Turkey's actions show anything but faith and we need to make sure that those actions are challenged um, and they are held to account for breaching international law. Um, if, if you want to judge somebody by their future actions, then their past actions are a good judge of that. Uh, I think that we need to make sure that we um, 
we do take on Turkey and that Turkey is held to account for what uh, they are doing. Um, I've had uh, correspondence recently about uh, Hagia Sophia, uh, about the conversion of that into a mosque. Um, that was, again, that shows uh, a lack of uh, understanding about the sensitivities of that and the lack of respect for UNESCO. Um, so we want to make sure Turkey um, does understand where these issues are and is how to count. Um, I'll continue to do what I can do for the uh, diaspora and support my constituents uh, and working with the APBG. And uh, I thank Sir Roger for sharing it again in such a, uh, an excellent way. And I hope that we continue to make progress uh, in Cyprus's uh, 60th uh, birthday and that we have a uh, um, celebrating the 61st birthday. Thank you. Thank you, Bambo. Um, next up, I think Christine Jarding will say a few words. Uh, Vice Chair of the All Party Group. Thank you very much, Christos. And I'd like to thank the Minister for his words tonight and indeed everybody um, for what they have said. And I would like just to echo what um, Alistair Carmichael said on behalf of my party, the Liberal Democrats, about the unity there is um, across all parties about um, the position on Cyprus and the need for an, an adherence to international law. Um, I remember the invasion of Cyprus from, um, I would like to say my childhood, but was slightly older than that. And it seems inconceivable now, 46 years later, that the problem is still not resolved. Um, and I think that, as everyone has said tonight, that has to be the aim um, for all of us of finding a peaceful resolution under international law. And just one last thing I would like to say, as I keep it brief, is that it was only recently that I discovered that I share something quite important as Cyprus. We are, in fact, the same age almost. Um, and so <laughs> it's a particular pleasure for me this evening. And I look forward to many more discussions and many more meetings about Cyprus. Thank you. Thank you, Christine. To close tonight's event, um, who better but uh, Theresa Villiers. Um, over to you. Thank you. Well, it, it's an honour to be part of this event. Um, and thank you to, to Christos and the National Federation of Cypriots for once again bringing us all together to mark the 46th anniversary of the invasion, even though events mean that uh, this has to be via computer rather than in person. It's been my privilege to support events like this on Cyprus for many years. It's a great privilege for me to be able to speak alongside such a distinguished panel, including, of course, the foreign ministers from both the UK and Cyprus. And um, I will always campaign for freedom for Cyprus. Uh, that is the strong position of my party, the Conservatives. We have, we have backed Cypriots over many years in their efforts to try and secure a negotiate settlement. And of course, I also feel another important role for me is to advocate enthusiastically for very close and cordial relations between the UK and Cyprus. And I welcome the chance today to celebrate some of the many achievements of the Republic of Cyprus over the last six years and to look ahead with others at the future island. And huge strides forward have been made by the Republic since 1960. It's primarily speaking, it's, it's a beacon of stability in what sadly continues to be an unstable region in the Eastern Mediterranean. And of course, it's been incredibly successful in raising living standards and enhancing prosperity in the six decades of independence. And of course, uniting the island would deliver a major economic dividend, which would be felt especially strongly in that part of Cyprus, which is currently under occupation. And I want to take this opportunity to strongly condemn the statements made indicating that the Turkish authorities are proposing to give the green light to development in and around Famagusta. I was shocked to hear about this from my constituents, such as Nos and Antonis Savidis, and others who were forced to flee from their homes in Famagusta in 1974. And it would be totally unacceptable for building, further building to take place on land owned 
by exiled Greek Cypriots. And likewise today, I think it's important that we condemn incursion by Turkey, the unlawful incursion by Turkey into the Cyprus exclusive economic zone. And as others have said, this has been clearly rejected by the UK government, the EEZ, is recognised throughout the world under accepted principles of the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, and this is unacceptable behaviour by Turkey, which the UK government has repeatedly stated should not be taken place. And I was also, like others, saddened to hear of a further decision in Ankara calculated to divide rather than to unite. And that, of course, is the plan to turn Sophia into a mosque. This stunning cathedral is one of the greatest monuments ever created by the Eastern Roman Empire. It stood for nearly one and a half thousand years. In this country, we barely have a wall standing, which is that old. And I'm so conscious of the culture of spiritual significance of Hagia Sophia for many Orthodox Christian. And I sincerely hope that the worldwide opposition to Mr. Erdogan's plan will see that decision unturned. And I want to conclude by sending my best wishes to Cypriots on, in this 60th anniversary year. I wish them well with their recovery from the COVID ap- epidemic. And of course, I wish them well with recovery from the COVID economic recession. I reiterate my strong sympathies and condolences to everyone who's lost loved ones in this pandemic, whether in the UK or in Cyprus. The COVID lockdown has created one of the most severe global recessions since record began. Times will be hard. That should not halt efforts to secure a settlement. And I very much welcome the commitment of President Anastasia. He's reiterated by Nikos here this evening to resuming negotiations. And I sincerely hope that one day very soon we'll see real progress towards an agreement and an end finally to 46 years of hurt and division. Thank you. Thank you, Teresa. Um, Brilliant as always. Um, Minister, thank you very much for joining us. Um, uh, Members of the All Party Group and Opposition Spokesman, thank you very much for joining us and making this virtual event a success. Thank you.